So we are in week three of Vicinity NYC, and if you want to take notes or write a sermon title, this week's message is called In the Middle. And I want to begin in the middle with actually a question to kind of start. Uh, and so what question I want to know by show of hands, is anyone here big on like personal space? Like, I mean, you want like you, your personal space matters. People, you feel violated like almost at any given instant if someone is too close. Anyone keep, show your hands. Personal space matters to you. Okay, so you get to keep your hands raised. There's, there's a few of you. You can keep your hands raised. Okay, let me take it a, a degree further. Like, do you get bothered or is it make you extremely uncomfortable when you feel like there are too many people in your space? Okay. All right, so that's like we're all in the wrong city. We're, we're just in the wrong place. This is not the place to be if it makes you uncomfortable to have too many people in your surrounding. I, I don't know what your circumstance is, but for me, to me, I'm pretty good. I, I have personal space. I like my personal space, but I'm also okay understanding, like, you know, if it's a crowded elevator, it is what it is. If you're on a packed subway, whatever, it is what it is. But to me, the absolute worst place, the absolute kind of worst circumstance or situation I find myself in when it comes to people being in my or invading my personal space is exiting MetLife Stadium. Uh, MetLife Stadium over in New Jersey where the New York Giants play football and the New York Jets just show up. Um, and, and so where that stadium, if you've ever been there for a concert or an event or anything that goes on there, like, you know, it's, it's a whole ordeal. I mean, getting there is a pain because the most economical way to get there is just taking the New Jersey Transit and, you know, dealing with Penn Station, which that's another illustration for another day. This illustration is about MetLife. And so you get to MetLife, you get there, you enjoy your experience. You know, I've been there multiple times for concerts. I've been there for uh, sporting events. And, you know, you get there and it's packed, great experience. But the worst is leaving MetLife Stadium. Because when you leave MetLife Stadium, it's a stadium that seats, I think, upwards of like 85,000 people. And so uh, for a football game, I should say 85,000. For a concert, it could pack out up to probably close to 100,000 people. And so when you leave this thing, Everyone at the end of the event typically tries to leave around the same time. And everyone or a large percentage of those 85,000 or 100,000 people are coming back to New York City, which means they're, most of them are going to be taking the subway or, the, excuse me, the New Jersey transit system to get back. And so when you leave the stadium and as you exit the stadium, exiting the actual physical stadium is okay. You get outside the corridor and then it's time to get back to like where the trains uh, board and depart or whatever. And so the way they do this is they have these kind of corridors that are kind of fenced off or, or, or blocked off, and they just kind of zigzag you through these things. And literally, when I tell you it's herding cattle, it's herding cattle. Like, it's just these big spaces, and they just kind of push large groups of people together. And then they have them blocked off by sections. And essentially, these sections represent the number of people that can, quote, safely fit onto a train. And so they don't count. They don't necessarily you know, count heads and make sure that it's a, an actual number. It's basically, if you can fit this many people in this space, these many people can fit onto this train, which means that everyone tries to squeeze into this physical space because the further forward you can move, then the more likely you are to get onto a sooner departing train, right? So you kind of herd in and you're kind of like a penguin shuffle, like move your way into this thing. People are touching you. People are breathing on you people have probably had a little bit too much to drink at these events. And so they don't smell the best, okay? And it's an open air stadium, so if it's a summer or fall event, you know, it's just not a great experience. But literally, when I'm stuck on this thing for all sorts of reasons, I'm sitting like, this is the worst decision I've ever made. Who thought going to Coldplay was gonna be awesome? Who thought going to a New York Giants game was gonna be awesome? Who thought this was a great idea? Like, this is a nightmare because you're stuck in here and then you're just, literally, you're stuck because you don't always get on the first train, right? So you gotta wait in kind of like these three or four group sections for however long it takes to board a train, send it off, get on the next train, send that one off. And so you're just completely at a standstill, hands to your side, you're doing one of these to like scratch your face because you don't wanna like assault someone on accident. And, and so it's just like the worst thing. And there's a whole lot of things that I don't like about it, but if I were to kind of boil it down to one word or one reason why that situation, more than any other situation I find myself in, bothers me or is kind of an, feel like it's an invasion of my space, it's because I would sum it up in this one word, uncomfortable, completely uncomfortable. It's just not what I want. It's not what I prefer. It's not what I enjoy. It's not what I like. And when we think about personal space, really, that's what it comes down to. It's about our comforts. We like our spaces to feel comfortable. When someone steps too close or when someone is breathing on you, you're like, whoa, that makes me uncomfortable. 
It could also make you angry. It could also make you furious. It could also you know, cause you to respond violently. But the core thing in this, the core issue, is this lack of comfortability. And you think about this in all your spaces. Think about your home, your apartment, where you live. It's why you arrange furniture a certain way, right? It's why you position the sofa over here or your desk over here or your bed or whatever. Because it, you want it, when you step into that space, you want it to feel comfortable. Think about your office or your desk or your workspace, right? Like maybe for some of you, this isn't a great illustration because it's just kind of chaos and it looks like a tornado hit your desk. But for me, I like my workspace to look clean and to be organized because that creates comfort where I feel I can be productive. And then it's not just you know, your work or you know, your, your office space or your home, but think about like the neighborhood you live in. And, and, and if you've had the privilege of moving into a neighborhood or choosing a neighborhood, then you're like, this is what's comfortable. Or if you're moving someplace, it's like, do I really want to leave this place because I know it, I know the transportation, I know the, the neighborhood, the restaurants, the spots I'm going to hang out at. Like this is all, like, those are all aspects or levels of comfort. And so our physical spaces matter to us because they bring us a level of comfort. But it's not just our physical spaces, it's also our relational spaces. When you think about the people we associate with, you think about the people you hang out with, the people you're connected to, more than likely, a majority of those people live like you, act like you, talk like you, think like you, walk like you, and work like you, right? And that's what brings us comfort. That's familiar to us. That's normal. In fact, it's not just something you decide as an adult. It's something you decided as a child. When you were a kid, you played with kids who were interested in the same toys or games or activities that you were interested in. When you loved hobbies or sports or whatever, you played and associated with kids on that team because you felt like, okay, they get it, we get it, we're friends, we, we hang out, we connect, and it's familiar and it's comfortable. And so we, from a, from a young age, have grown up kind of getting connected with people who live, breathe, act, walk, think, and, 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 and associate with us because it makes us feel more comfortable. The problem is, when you start talking about engaging your vicinity, what you find is that not everyone is like you. Not everyone lives like you. Not everyone acts like you. Not everyone thinks like you. Not everyone walks like you. Not everyone talks like you. There's people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic statuses, different belief systems, different ideologies, different philosophies, different upbringings, different experiences. Everything, in fact, if you were to really kind of go down the line, you could look and say, everything about us is different, which is why I believe we choose or often choose not to engage in our vicinity. Because of the differences, it makes us uncomfortable. Well, I'm not like that person, or I didn't grow up like that person, or my skin color is not the same as that person, or we don't hang out with the same people, or we don't wear the same clothing, or we don't have the same kind of accent, or we don't have the same uh, kind of experience, or we don't have this, that, or the other. And so we write these things off because the fact is if we were to engage with that person, there's a level of discomfort that we would have to overcome in order to actually connect and build a bridge. And so we say, well, that's kind of difficult or that's kind of challenging. And so I'd rather not engage in that vicinity because they don't look like me, act like me, think like me. And, and, and this is something, again, it's not like an indictment as much as it is a reality of the fact that this is how we're kind of wired or this is the way that we've been raised or this is the way that we've become accustomed to as normal or appropriate. And, and there's an interesting story. In fact, there's an incredible example of this that takes place in the New Testament where this very situation or this type of situation is exemplified. And it's a story involving a guy by the name of Paul. And Paul was, you know, an apostle. Paul was someone that a lot of Christians know about, someone that maybe you're familiar with his story. But if you don't know his story, here's kind of Paul's journey in a nutshell. Paul was a Hebrew boy, and he grew up in Jerusalem. And at a young age, like most Hebrew boys, he grew up learning about the religious system and the religious customs of the Hebrew people. And at some point, probably by the time he was six, seven years old, it was identified that Paul had potential or potential to become a religious leader, that something within him, he had an aptitude or just kind of a knack for figuring this God thing out and understanding it and embracing it and pursuing it. And so from a young age, he was identified and tapped as someone who could become a religious leader, but not just any religious leader, the cream of the crop, the top of religious leaders, the Pharisees. This was the people who knew God's law in and out, who lived it every single day, who weren't just living it and knowing it, but were responsible for making sure it was lived out and known by others. And so Paul grew up in this system. Paul grew up, he was groomed, he was educated, he was raised, he was trained to become a religious Pharisee. And at some point, Paul began kind of picking this thing up, and he wasn't just any Pharisee, he was one of the best. 
He started climbing this ladder, getting to the top of this, so much so that his job was literally to chase out or imprison anyone who opposed or believed something other than the Hebrew tradition. In fact, his main target were people who were known, not as Christians back then, but as followers of the way, specifically followers of the way of Jesus. And so Paul would go around persecuting people and, and kind of trying to arrest them or imprison them. And that's where he, on one experience, on his travels from Jerusalem to the north in the city of Damascus in modern day Syria, Paul had this incredible divine encounter with God where he's on this road to Damascus and he meets Jesus face to face and has this encounter that doesn't just change his, his goal or his objective on this trip, but actually changes the goal and the objective of his life. And that same zealousness, that same passion, that same excitement, that same commitment that he had for his Hebrew tradition actually was moved over to Jesus. And thank God he removed the violence. And thank God he left this. And Paul would become kind of one of the people at the forefront of spreading the way of Jesus so much so that he would travel across all of modern day Europe, starting and initiating these gospel movements we now call churches. And that's where we find Paul in Acts chapter 17 on his way into a new city. And here's where we begin in verse 16. Here's how Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, describes it. He says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You're saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. Now, pause. When people start speaking strange things to me, I don't want to know more about it. I was like, oh, yeah, it's time for me to go. Uh, I'm going to take my Starbucks cup of coffee and leave. Um, like, but these people were interested. They're curious, and here's why, okay? Okay. Um, Verse 21, it should be noted, parenthetically, it should be noted or explained that all Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Verse 22, so Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way, for as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. Have you ever been completely out of your comfort zone? Like think about a situation where you've been completely just, it just was so weird or so different or so unique or so bizarre from what you were accustomed to. It just made you completely uncomfortable. Chris and I this summer will celebrate 12 years of marriage. And while things are great today, yeah, that's a good thing. It's 12, right? Okay. Uh, it's 12 years. And so we're, we're doing great. We're rocking it. But it wasn't always that way. We grew up with different backgrounds. We grew up with different customs. We literally grew up in different geographic regions on the, either side of the country. And so we had different experiences, we had different perspectives, we have different cultures, we have different customs. And so we dated for a couple years, we got married, and as we got married, those things started to, I wouldn't say merge as much as collide. And, and so it wasn't really pleasant, like emerging lane. It was just like, bam, like head on. And one of those areas was in an area that we all agree is important, an area that we all agree matters, dinner. And so we would have dinner. And here's the thing. When we moved, we got married. A year after we got married, we moved uh, to the Pacific Northwest. And we lived there. I was working at a church with her family, with her dad as my, my boss slash father-in-law. And so we lived close by to my in-laws. And one of the things we would do is hang out with my in-laws. We'd go eat food over there. We would go hang out with them. And so whenever we'd get for, together for dinner, we had two different expectations of what this dinner was going to be about. And so we'd go over, and Krista's family, they had the tradition that, you know, someone would prepare the food or whoever prepared it. The food would be set out on the table. And then everyone would sit at the table. And then everyone would take the food and share and pass and help serve one another. And then you would sit down, you would eat, and you would talk, and you would discuss and have all these things, right? No big deal. But my family was not that way, okay? That's what she was used to. That's what she was accustomed to. My family was a little bit different. And my family, my mom would cook the food, leave it on the stove, and then yell, if you want food, you better get it, because if you go hungry, that's your fault, not mine. And so that was it. That was dinner. And so I would go, and I would get my food. I would sit at a table, or I would sit on the couch, or I'd go to my room, whatever. I'd eat my food, and then I'd sit there. Very rarely did we ever sit and have 
a dinner as a family at a table, unless it was like a holiday or a special occasion. So again, not too big of a discrepancy, not too big of an issue. But when we started you know, having dinner with our family, we'd sit down you know, at the table and like, OK, this is nice to be seated. And we would pass and serve the food to one of them. Like, oh, this is kind of nice because my mom just told me to get it myself. And so I can help someone in this. And this is a good idea. And we would talk about some things. And it was like, OK, that's fine, too. Like, we would eat. The food was always good, never a gripe about the food. And we would talk, and that was fine. But it wasn't necessarily the meal or the process of the meal that was the problem or the, the, the lack of comfort. It was what happened after the meal. Because in her family, after you ate dinner and after everyone was done, you sat at the table and you talked. In my family, food was just a matter of survival. And so not like in an extreme dramatic way, but just like you just ate and that was it. Like you didn't have to talk after. And so we would sit at her table. I'm not kidding you. We would sit at her family's table sometimes for an hour to two hours talking. And I felt trapped. I didn't know what to do. Because uh, I would sit there. I'm like, I got a dirty dish in front of me. Like this needs to go in the sink. I'm like, why can't we just talk on the couch? Why can't we watch TV? Why do we got to talk about these things? Why are you asking me questions? They would ask me questions. I'd be like, Yes, you know, like I didn't know what it was. Like, what, like, what do I got to say to get this thing wrapped up and over with? Like, do I, do I got to go to the bathroom? Do I fake a phone call? Like, do I have somewhere to be? I can't because my wife would know if I have somewhere to be, so I can't fake it. I can't. So we would sit for like an hour, and it was just, I'm a social guy, but I was completely uncomfortable. I felt completely out of my element. It was just awkward because these were new people in my life. It was awkward because this was a new practice in my life. It was awkward because there's a dirty dish and it's making me a little bit weird. I'm not a germaphobe, but it's weird. Like it can go in the sink. Can I get up and do that? Is that a violation of the agreement? Like I didn't know what the issue was, but it just made me uncomfortable. And, and we've all had those kind of experiences. And I don't know what triggers it for you or what circumstance you're reminded of, but I imagine what you felt and I imagine what I felt is exactly what Paul felt when he stepped into this circumstance. Because here is Paul in an unfamiliar city with unfamiliar people speaking in an unfamiliar circle, completely out of his comfort zone, potentially even trying to engage and connect with people in an unfamiliar language. And so Paul has to deal with this reality that he's in a totally different situation, that he's in a totally different world, that he's completely out of his element. And he has to engage and connect. But what's really interesting about what Paul did, what's really interesting about what happened to Paul and how or where he ended up is that that's actually not where he started. He did not begin in the high council. He did not start there. He started elsewhere. Go back to verses 16, 16 and 17. Here's what it says. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Then notice verse 17. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. Now pause. You see, Paul didn't begin in the high council. Paul was in the city. He was troubled by what he saw. And then he went to the synagogue. He went to the place where the Jews were, where the God-fearing Gentiles were, where the people who looked like him, walked like him, talked like him, and believed like him would be found. He went to his place of comfort. He went to his place where people believed like him and it would soothe his troubles. Now, isn't it interesting isn't it funny how quickly we will retreat to a place of comfort when something around us troubles us? Isn't it interesting how something that we see, something that we observe in our vicinity, something that is uh, an issue is, oh, well, that makes me uncomfortable, so let me move away from it and let me step into a place where I do feel comfortable. It's exactly what Paul did. It's exactly where he began, and Christians are notorious for this. We are notorious. Yes, there's a good element of it. Yes, there's a good thing in it. Yes, you should have community. Yes, you should have camaraderie. Yes, you should find unity. Yes, being with other people who believe like you is strengthening and supportive. But far too often, it's not we're doing that to find support. We're not doing it to find strength, but we're doing it to run away from the circumstances that actually trouble us. We're doing it, we're retreating from something when we see trouble, when we experience trouble, when something in our vicinity creates trouble within us. Rather than stepping into it, we step out of it Rather than, that, rather than uh, choosing to be an answer, we just consider it a problem. And Paul, in this moment, in this situation, said, you know what, there's something that troubles me. But he went back to his place of comfort. But it goes on, verse 18. It says this. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Now, I'm going to pause right here because I think one of the things that, you know... This word debate, it's, it's interesting. 
Because whether it's social media, the likes of Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, this is our first instinct. Let's get in a debate with someone we don't agree with. Let's get in a debate with someone who doesn't believe like us. Let's get in a debate with someone who's not in the same field or same sphere as us. Let's debate, debate, debate. Let's argue. Let's counter argue. Let's retweet. Let's you know subtweet. You know, let's throw shade on this Instagram story. Let's throw shade in this post. You know, and and let's debate. But you know what's really interesting is that actually this is a poor translation. The Greek word, in fact, if I were to rewrite this myself, not that I'm a scholar by any means, but the Greek word that's used here for debate actually means encounter. The literal translation is encounter. In fact, if you go over just one chapter to chapter 18, it's used in chapter 18, verse 27, as meeting. This is the only time that this word, for whatever reason, the people who translated the New Living Translation translated this word as debate. In fact, if you look at it in a different translation, you would find it would say encounter or conferred because that's the more accurate rendering of this verse. So Paul actually had an encounter with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, here's what they said. What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas that he's picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. And so Paul has this kind of... um, way about him. And it goes on to verse 19. And here's where it goes. It says, then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You see, Paul started at the temple, right? He started over here in his place of safety, in his place of familiarity, in his place of comfort. And he somehow ended up over here in the high council. He went from that space to this space. And there's this very, you almost miss it. It's very subtle, but it's very clear progression. In fact, it's, it's so... Um, It's so unmistakable that once I show this to you, once I reveal this to you, you will never see this verse or this scripture. In fact, I would make the argument, you'll never see your life in the same way again. Because there's a distinct progression that happened from this space to this space. And within this story and within each of your lives, there are distinct spaces that God wants to invite you into, that God wants to lead you through so that you can connect and engage in your vicinity And those spaces have distinct purposes, they have distinct rules, and they have distinct opportunities for each and every one of us, but they're essential and they're critical in order for us to engage the vicinity or our vicinity in the way that Jesus would call us to and in the way that Jesus did himself. And so Paul entered, I'm going to start with this idea of a first space. A first space. And a first space, you know, consists of your home, your friends, your church, your community, You are most comfortable in this first space. This is where most of your life is lived. This is where most of your connections are. This is where the things, essentially, the the things that you choose exist. It's here in this first space. See, this is your place of familiarity. This is your place of identity. And that's why when Paul retreated to the temple, he was retreating to his first space, a place where people believed like him a place where people agreed with him, a place where people talked like him and looked like him and sounded like him. When Paul was troubled, he went to a first space. It was comfortable for him. It represented a place of safety and familiarity. Now, these spaces are important. We all need spaces where we feel safe. We all need spaces where we feel, you know, that there's a family feel. That's kind of that same root word of familiarity, that there's this kind of connection, a bond, a strengthening, a unity. These spaces matter. These spaces are important. And these spaces, I would argue, are actually good for us. But the problem is we think or we assume that these should be or these are the only spaces. And that's just not the case because there's a second space. And the second space is where your life here in this first space intersects with the lives of others. This second space is represented by the public square in verse 17. When Paul stepped out of the temple and he stepped into the public square, the public gathering place, and he started encountering Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and he started engaging and connecting with people in that vicinity, it's when he stepped out of the first space and stepped into the second space. And, and, and this space is familiar to you but it doesn't belong to you. And it doesn't belong to you because it consists of things like this. It consists of your workplace. It consists of the building that you live in. It consists of the gym you go to, the restaurant you frequent, the stores you shop at. These are places 
that aren't exclusive are limited to you. Even your building, you may live there, but so do others. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. But it's not yours. It's where your life intersects with these people. And it's in these second spaces that you encounter people from different backgrounds, that you encounter different beliefs, that you encounter people who are maybe similar to you but not exactly like you. And it's in this space, to be quite honest, where things start to get a little bit uncomfortable because it's not very comfortable for me to walk into my gym and tell someone to shut up who's grunting and moaning really loud for no real reason. It's not my space. It's our space. We share it, I guess, but it's kind of weird. I would never do that, but that person is different than me. And I suppose they're entitled to grunting and moaning for no reason when they're just sitting on a piece of equipment. But to each their own. But that's the deal with the second space. And this is where you come into contact with the people in your vicinity, the people you walk by, the people you commute with, the people you work with the people you kind of do that half-hearted smile to in the hallway because you don't know what to say and you don't know how to act. So you're like, and it's kind of like a crooked smile, but it doesn't really know. Like, I don't know if you're saying hi or hello or you're trying to be friendly as much as you're just trying not to be awkward, but you make it more awkward when you do that. This is what happens here in the second space. But these two spaces are not the only spaces. See, there's a third space. And this third space, you see, Paul's experience didn't end in the temple. And his experience didn't end over here in the, in the marketplace or the public square. His experience progressed over to the high council, to the Areopagus is what it's called. And the Areopagus was a space where the most educated, the most learned, the most kind of diverse opinions or people of, of diverse opinions would gather to discuss and to connect and to hang out. And this space is where it gets really uncomfortable this space is where it gets really just kind of unfamiliar, where it's, it's not really the territory that you would choose. It's not really the territory that you would abide by or the rules that you would live by because this space is not, if you can see, it's, it's not directly connected to your space. In fact, you almost have to progress to get into this space. And, and that's because this third space consists of their home and, and, and their friends and their communities. You see, in this third space, it's not about your preferences. It's not about your beliefs. It's not about your lifestyle or your upbringing or your way of living. It's not even really about your opinions. It's about them. It's about their home. You see, this is what's comfortable to us, but this is what's comfortable to them because it belongs to them. Yeah. This is where they feel most normal, or most authentic, or most true, or most down to earth, or most relaxed, just like you would here. And, and in this third space, the thing about it is that you can't play by your rules, which is why we choose not to engage. Because if I can't play by my rules, then I don't want to play at all. We're still all that four-year-old or five-year-old child who wants to play by our own rules and assumes and believes that everyone needs to play by our rules. And I say that as individuals, but I also say that collectively as Christians and as a church. You see, because for far too long, as Christians and as churches, we've done everything to concentrate about our comforts, about our conveniences, about our preferences, about our beliefs, about our way of living, about our lifestyle, about our choices. And we've said, this is what matters. This is what trumps everything. We've made it, and we've constructed these Christian bubbles that say, this is what's familiar and comfortable to us. And so we need to stay within that. And if something troubles us real quick, run back over here to that first space and don't touch it because you might become like it. Yeah. And don't touch it and don't look at it and don't engage it because you never know what you're going to get. You never know what you're going to catch. And, and we've made it about being and doing the things that keep us in this. Mm -hmm. And we've lost sight of these things over here. And, and, and you know, the, the interesting thing is not always true in this way, but it seems like even for the majority of the time when Christians have chosen to step out of this first space and chosen to engage in their vicinity, it's simply been about trying to get people from the second space back into our space. That the agenda, the motive has truly been, well, if we can just connect with them real quick, but only for a little bit, just long enough where they're willing to come into our space, then it'd be worth it. Then it'd be meaningful, at least to us. 
But the problem is that people in the third space are not comfortable in our space, just like we're not comfortable in their space. Because again, this is where they can be authentic. This is where they can be vulnerable. This is where they can share their fears, their doubts, their worries, their hurts, their pain, their struggles, their questions, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations. That all exists here, not here. And, and yet, the thing about this space, the interesting thing about this space is that you don't get access to this space unless you're invited into this space. But you can't be invited into this space unless you engage in this space, here in the middle. In the middle, and how we engage. This is the space that makes the difference. This is the space that matters. You see, we've been really, really good about the first space. We've been really, really good about creating spaces where Christians feel comfortable. And sometimes we're even good enough where we can create a space in this first space where people who are non-Christians feel good in that first space. And I think we should. I think we should be commended for that. But the problem is not creating a first space. The problem is getting out of the first space and engaging in the middle. Engaging in this second space, how we work, how we connect, how we engage in the middle is what makes the difference. And Vicinity NYC is not simply about getting people into a first space. In fact, it's nothing to do about getting people into a first space. It's about engaging in the middle space. It's about stepping into the middle. This is what granted Paul access into the third space. This is what privileged him and gave him the opportunity to connect there. And even from within this text, I think there are things that that stand out that actually teach us from Paul's example and from Paul's lifestyle, how we can engage, how we can connect in the middle so that it makes a difference in the third, so that it makes a meaningful connection, a meaningful transformation in that third space. I want to share three thoughts with you quickly, and, and I'll give these to you. The verses won't be on the screen. I'll just kind of highlight them as we go. But here's the first thing Paul did, okay? Paul chose honor over dishonor. I'll read the, the beginning of verse 22, okay? This is what Paul says. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. Okay, now here, here's what Paul did. Men of Athens, let me give you a title. Let me ascribe to you honor. You're the privileged men of this city, of this society, and I recognize who you are. And then he says, I notice that you're religious in every way. Here's the funny thing. Paul didn't agree with their religions, but he didn't dishonor them. He didn't disrespect them. He didn't defy them or defile them by saying, hey, you believe in stupid stuff. Let me tell you about the true thing. In fact, he honored their noble aspiration to know the true God. And he said, yeah, you might have a diversity of gods. You might have a diversity of beliefs. But I believe there's something honorable in your pursuit of trying to know who God is. So men of Athens, I notice that you are religious in every way. He's ascribing honor and choosing to honor over dishonor. You see, disagreement is never justification for dishonor. Disagreement is never justification to remove dignity from someone. Disagreement is never justification to say, you know what, I can disrespect you. But yet we make it a practice or common uh, or acceptable even to say, you know what, I don't agree with you or I don't believe in that or I don't pursue that, so I will discredit or minimize who you are. And and Paul said, you know, I'm going to honor who you are, even though I disagree. I'm going to honor who you are, even though I believe differently. I'm going to honor who you are because I believe that God has so much more for you. So Paul chose honor over dishonor. Secondly, Paul observed instead of judged. Paul observed instead of judged. Here's what he says in verse 23. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and on one of your altars it had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. You know how Paul knew that? Because he observed, because he learned, because he engaged, because he read and he saw what was happening in the city. Something troubled him, something disturbed him, but he said, instead of pulling away, instead of stepping back, let me lean in and let me learn. In fact, and then when he speaks about it and when he proclaims about it, he says, you know, here's what I observed, not what I judged. He didn't say, here's what I've observed and it's wrong. 
Here's my judgment upon what's happening here in this city. Here's my judgment upon who you are as a people. Here's my judgment upon who you are as a group. Here's my judgment upon who you are as an individual. Here's my judgment upon what you've become or what you've trusted or what you've fallen short of. He just simply said, here's what I've observed. Here's what I've learned from. Here's what I've witnessed. And I'm going to withhold my judgment. I'm going to withhold my condemnation because I'm trying to gain insight and traction into who you are and have a better understanding of who you're becoming so that we can walk the journey with you versus distancing myself from you. So he observed instead of judged. Thirdly, this is what Paul did. He informed, not imposed. He informed, not imposed. So he says, you have this unknown God, verse 23. He says, you have an inscription onto an unknown God. So he says, this God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. Let me inform you about someone. Let me share some good news with you. Let me tell you, you've got a shrine to an unknown God. You're so zealous, you're so committed, you're so worried that you might be missing one. Let me tell you about the one that you're missing. Let me inform you with something, not so that I can force you to believe like me, not so that I can twist your arm and get you to, you know, prayer, prayer, not so that I can get you to come to my space, but so that I can inform you and then you can make a decision if you like. But I'm here to tell you there's someone you don't know about and I know who it is and I want you to know about him, but I'm not going to force him upon you because he didn't force himself on me. So I'm here to inform you. You see, grace doesn't force its way upon us. Grace invites us into something. Grace doesn't choose to press itself into us. It chooses instead to pull us into a greater story, into a greater narrative, into a greater transformation. And Paul said, I'm here not to impose, but to inform. There's someone you don't know about, and I'm here to tell you who he is. I'm here to tell you how he changed my life. I'm here to tell you how he transformed who I am. I'm here to tell you, and Paul would go on to speak and he would connect the dots for them. And he'd say, this God or this poet spoke in this way. And the person that you followed spoke to this thing or alluded to this belief. And let me tell you, that's who my God is. That's what he's done. That's what he wants to bring for you. And this is how the people responded at the end. Notice after what happened after he finished talking. Verse 32, when they heard Paul speak about the excuse me, the resurrection of the dead, Some laughed in contempt. Isn't that what we're always scared of? Oh, but what if they laugh at me? What if they make fun of me? What if they tell me that's stupid? What if they tell me that's dumb? What if they tell me that's like you're an idiot or that no one can take you seriously? Some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined him and became believers. You see, We need to be a people of the middle space. We need to be a people of the second space, not so that we can get them into our space, but so they can invite us and trust us to bring us into their space so that their vulnerabilities, their questions, their asks. And yeah, you know what? Some may not receive it. Some may not accept it. Some may not believe it, but that's okay. Will everyone do this? No. Will everyone follow? No. But listen, while some will laugh, others will lean in. And when they lean in, that's when they can experience the transformative power of Jesus. That's when Jesus can transform that doubt into faith. That's when Jesus can transform that hurt into healing. That's where Jesus can take what was missing and make it complete and fulfilled. When we step into their space, it gives Jesus the opportunity to bring them into his space. And it's exactly what Paul did. He wasn't worried about those who would laugh. He wasn't worried about those who would kick him out. He was concerned only with those who would say, hey, I want to learn more. I want to lean in and I want to follow. And Paul would use those people who would follow to become influencers of the city of Athens and allow him to kind of carry his message beyond this one city to an entire region, all because he stepped out of his comfort zone in this first space and entered into the third space. And met a church when we do the same, when we refuse to limit ourselves or confine ourselves by the boundaries and the rules and the regulations of this first space and say, you know what? I'm going to engage here in the middle. I'm going to step into my place of work. I can't manipulate the third space. I can't force my way in. But how I live here is what's going to give me access there. That's the opportunity we have. That's the invitation God's extending to us. And so as we wrap up, the preaching portion of this series, my challenge that I want to issue to all of us is to be a people of the middle, 
to be a person engaged in the middle, just like Paul did, just how Paul lived. And when we do that, we'll start to change the city and change the world. I want to pray for us, and then we'll wrap up our service this morning.